Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the Rumbos podcast. Great to be here. That's great to have you. So um, super excited to have you on the show. Your name has come up numerous times in, in our Run Buzz Facebook community group. And so um, through one of our members, actually, David Pillard, who reached out to uh, Chris um, Twiggs, which I believe is your uh, training uh, director or something like that. Anyways, they were able to connect us, but me and you actually had a connection back in 2015 when you came and spoke at a conference I attended, a fitness conference in Savannah, Georgia, and we went out and ran uh, one morning <laughs> um, in that hot, humid Savannah summer. So I um, don't know if you remember that or not, but you definitely may not remember me, but you probably remember the conference. But um, that's how we have a connection, actually. But a couple of years have gone by since then, and uh, glad to have you back on the show. So officially, we have been running buddies. So that's that's for the record. There you go. Once you run with somebody, I guess you can say you're running buddies at that point. That's right. Um, so I previously introduced you uh, prior to us talking at a high level, and we're going to get into some of those things uh, in, in a bit here. But I'm really fascinated by origin stories, and I think it helps bring out the guest's life and and what happened maybe we all know you for your training programs and, and being an Olympian and the, all the books you write I mean your list of things that you've accomplished is, is incredible but what I really want to know is to back before all that and talk about how you got into running as a kid or at whatever point that was back before you were even a great runner well, I'd like to hear what that what what that was like sure Steve uh... It's a very improbable story. The uh, bottom line is that uh, my dad was in the Navy. I went to 13 schools my first seven years. And when I entered the eighth grade, the school I was going to required all boys to go out for strenuous athletics. Well, I had no skills. I had no conditioning. I had gained a whole lot of weight and I was lazy. I really didn't like exercise at all, but I had to do it. And so uh, it happened that I had fallen in with a group of kids who were runners because they were funny. And they convinced me to be able to uh, go out during the winter quarter, their first year for cross country conditioning. <clears throat> and I shied away from it. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I found ways to, uh, to sneak away and, uh, and not, have to run on on several of those workouts, but I was busted uh, several days later by one of the older kids who saw me hiding in the woods instead of running. And so <clears throat> I went out with his group determined to uh, <clears throat> find an excuse like <clears throat> something that hurt my legs or something <clears throat> so that I had to limp <clears throat> and had to stop. And uh, when uh, I uh, got to that particular point where I was going to quit. I was actually starting to feel the empowerment of running, of overcoming something. And um, even on the days during those first two weeks when I was physically destroyed and, and exhausted, I felt better in my head and in my spirit than I had ever felt in my life. And I, I knew that I wanted to find a way to train so that I could stay with this and, and avoid the bad stuff that I was experiencing. So um, the second thing that happened was that in my school career, uh, changing schools about every six months, I never really had a lot of friends. And as soon as I started running, I had good friends, running friends. And uh, I, I still can uh, connect with them to this day. It's really a neat thing uh, what happens when you're with a running group, as you know. And then the other major change in my life was I was at the bottom of my class. This was a highly academic prep school. And I had a lot of deficits in my educational background leading into the eighth grade. And it showed during that first semester, um, I was at the bottom. And uh, the kids that I was running with, 
were all on the honor roll. They were all smart and, and, and they helped me. They helped me get into good study habits. They also challenged me with all types of quiz questions leading up to tests and so forth. You know, the way runners do, they, they support one another. And uh, in a few quarters, I made my way to the honor roll also. So in every way, my life changed for the better when I started running, but I, I wasn't any good. Uh, it wasn't until my senior year that I qualified to go to the state championship in the state of Georgia. I showed no talent of moving up to a higher level. And uh, even when I went on to college, I was not offered a college scholarship. Uh, I went to a highly academic school, uh, which also happened to be the school where Amber Burfoot followed me the next year. And two years later, uh, Bill Rogers came, uh, a school that offered no uh, scholarships and athletics at all. Uh, but we came for the academics and we've been friends ever since. Um, and so the big uh, interruption in my running occurred when I graduated from college because I had, it was a time when the Vietnam War was at its height and I had a draft number of three, which meant I was going to go. Uh, so I enlisted in an officer program in the Navy and spent three years there. Uh, the first half of it was mostly off the coast of Vietnam where I could not run. Um, and so I, I, I gradually got back in to running during the second half of my Navy time and decided when I got out of the Navy in 1970, that it was my goal to try to qualify to get into the Olympic trials. And I was a long way away from that, but I uh, got into the uh, charter as a charter member of the Florida Track Club and got to hang out with Frank Shorter and Jack Batchelor. Jack had been on the 68 Olympic team. Uh, they taught me a lot. Uh, they supported me. And uh, the three of us went out to Vail, Colorado before the Olympic trials and trained for two months at altitude. And that pushed me over the top. I, uh, I needed a uh, minute and a half PR in the last chance I had to qualify for the 10K. And I ran a two minute PR in the national championship that year and qualified to get into the, uh, into the trials. It's interesting to me that you went to a highly academic college and just happened to run into those guys, right? Like that can't be a coincidence. Like, you know, that the, they're, they're legends in their own, you know, in their own case. Right. I mean, you've had the opportunity to, to run and train with some, some great people. I, I was doing a little bit of research and, and you knew Steve Prof, uh, Prefontaine who has uh, kind of his own, or about how what a beast he was at like just going hard and, and really um, keeping up to and, and I have a question about him just in general. Um, but Bill and Amby and, and Jack, you had the opportunity to run with people who pretty incredible field of runners. What was that experience like in terms of how it impacted your training? Like, and, and I'm sure likewise they'll say the same thing about you. But you're talking about people who. You know, we've only, I'm, I'm 52 and I grew up as a kid in the 70s, wasn't a runner until I was an adult. But as I become an adult and I learned more of the history, as I learned more of the history of, you know, everything from back from the Lydier days and, and forward, and even before him, um, we read about you guys in, in magazines or in interviews and things. What was that experience like working and training with those and how, how did that shape you as an athlete? Well, Steve, I could really go on for several hours about the serendipity situations where I have had just great connections with, uh, with Lydiard, for example. I actually brought him over for four years to come to my Tahoe running camp and uh, got to really experience firsthand what he was like and what his life was like. And, and Billy Mills uh, had several close encounters with uh, Billy doing projects together um, and on and on. Uh, with Steve Prefontaine, 
the uh, the experience, the connection was made uh, through my best friend in life, who I met when I was in the Navy. Uh, he and I were uh, on a relay team against one another, officer candidate school, and uh, we became fast friends and uh, and stayed close touch, doing things together uh, until he passed away a few years back. Uh, but he was the mentor of Steve Prefontaine in the whole Nike realm. Uh, he actually shared a desk with Steve. And whenever I was up in Eugene, which was regularly during that time period, uh, I would uh, do projects with my friend Jeff and with Steve. And I have to tell you, he was an amazing person. He uh, really was... Uh, a fellow that never looked back. He was always looking ahead at what he could do. And he would have made a major contribution to running. Uh, I think about him quite often and, and miss him practically every day on my run. Uh, the whole aura of that time was that there was no, the ironic aspect of it for me and Frank Shorter and, and Bill Rogers and others is that there was no hope of making a living off running during that era. We were doing it because we loved running. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the Federation who uh, selected uh, us for national teams and was the, uh, the promoter of our sport was called the AAU. And in the uh, movie, Prefontaine, which actually has a Jeff Galloway character in it, uh, that movie uh, has a very accurate portrayal of what the life was like uh, concerning what the AAU did to us to put us under their control. Uh, basically, they put all types of rules up so that we could not make a living. It was even against the, the rule, the amateur rule, to be able to coach and get money for coaching. Now, there were several coaches in that era who were top athletes who didn't accept any income from it, but uh, it, was, it was against their rules. Uh, and if you violated their rules, then you would not be eligible to go to the Olympics. And that's what we were shooting for. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, time for bonding for us and of establishing close friendships because uh, a lot of us were self-coached. I was self-coached throughout my whole career and I had no sponsors. Uh, so it was a, a thing that we had to make a living and we had to do our training. Uh, I was training between 140 and 200 miles a week. Uh, and then whatever time I had left over, uh, I wanted to go to bed and sleep. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can imagine um, what that would what be like being under those rules. Um, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about your experience leading up and actually getting into the, the 1972 Olympics. So my understanding was it was always a childhood dream to, to reach the Olympics. So that's kind of it's a lot of childhood dreams, honestly. And 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 for you, it was it was a driving force to to get there. But um, you know, I've heard that that was at least from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that was kind of a, a big surprise for you, that it kind of came unexpectedly, um, even though that, you, that was your goal. But I believe I heard in an interview that you were running a race like a week before the trials. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Uh, the scenario was that um, when I went up to, uh, well, just a little backdrop, uh, six months before the trials, I qualified to get into the marathon trials, which that year were held at the same time that the track trials were. Uh, our Olympic coach, Bill Bowerman from University of Oregon scheduled the Olympic trials just as the Olympics would be so that the Olympic marathon, uh, Olympic trials marathon was at the end of the Olympic trials. So uh, all three of us on the Florida Track Club ran the 10K one week 
before we ran the marathon trials. And uh, it, it ended up being quite good. But um, this was the first time that I had had a chance to compete in the Olympic trials. And I was just loving it. I was loving every aspect of it. I really believed that the altitude training would help, even though there were a lot of experts that felt that it would not help and it would, that it could actually hurt my chances. But I believed in it and I uh, put my whole being into the training that I did for two months up at Vail at 8,000 feet. But I didn't go to any races for two months. That was a very unusual thing when the, you're getting very close to a race like the Olympic trials and you don't race at all for two months. But it was my vision to focus on training and I did. And so I drove my little car from Vail out to Seattle for the national AAU championships and my last chance to qualify for the 10K, and uh, which was about two and a half weeks before the trials. And uh, I did, everything hit, uh, the weather was great and uh, the training really paid off. I'm a firm believer in altitude training. So then um, went down to Eugene and a group of us heard that there was going to be a, a race up in Portland nearby the uh, week before the trials started. It was a 5K and uh, I had just qualified to get in the 10K. I'd had very few races. Uh, and so I decided I needed another race. And again, that was uh, questionable as to whether running a hard race one week before the Olympic trials would be a smart thing to do. But uh, I got into this 5K and uh, I was running against guys that I had never thought that I'd be able to run with. Uh, I started out near the back of the pack as is my usual uh, scenario. And I moved up progressively lap by lap. Uh, and on the last lap, uh, I was in a group of about seven or eight and the group just took off and I went with them. And uh, as we entered the back stretch, most of the runners dropped off. Probably they were smartly realizing that they could hurt themselves by running so hard because we were running fast pace. Uh, I was going for it. And so I ended up in a, a, a sprinting match with uh, a South African runner there named Johnny Halberstadt, uh, who actually was one of the founders of Boulder Running Company. And Johnny and I duked it out stride for stride until the last stride of the race where he uh, lunged ahead of me. And we ran uh, 13.41 5K. I, you know, before Vail, I couldn't dream of running that fast. So I knew that things were coming together and uh, I uh, didn't give up. And I focused then on being ready for those trials. It's an incredible, incredible story. And um, yeah, I think sometimes we, we sell our body short and our mind gives up. And, and I think you going in it from that thing, like I'm going to do this and, and certainly helped you. Um, one question that came from the group, and this is more about uh, talking about your experience at the Olympics. Um, you know, we all know that 1972 was a weird year for the Olympics with the, the Munich, um, uh, the, the bombing on Athlete Village. The question that came up was, you know, what was your recollection of that experience? Um, you know, where were you when that happened? How did that impact the athletes? Um, you know, that's probably... You know, nowadays, if you heard about terrorism, we'd be like, oh, no, it's just another bad month. But but back then it was a pretty I mean, not that it isn't now, but it was a pretty rare case. What was that? What is your recollection about that? Where were you at during that time? Yes, there had not been a terrorist incident in the Olympics or for that matter, any major sporting event uh, before Munich. And uh, 
the incident occurred overnight uh, about 2 a.m. in which uh, some uh, Islamic terrorists broke into the Israeli compound and uh, took the Israeli hostage. They killed uh, a few athletes right away. And then, uh, and some of the uh, Israeli athletes got away. Uh, one of them actually was friends, was uh, a friend of mine and, and also had visited our quarters and he knew where to go. So he jumped out of the window and ran over and uh, pounded on Bill Bowerman's door. And uh, Bill wasn't really happy when he came to the door. Uh, and uh, Shal Adani is, is the Israeli athlete's name. He said, uh, they broke in, they killed our athletes. And uh, Bill said, calm down, now tell me what, what, what's going on. They came in and took over our rooms. And uh, Bill said very calmly, well, tell them to get out. And uh, then uh, Bill went to work calling the uh, uh, officials and the security in the Olympic Village, getting some extra security for us uh, on the U.S. team and, uh, and going to work. And it, it, it was a whole series of things that uh, I, I really treasure now in memories. But we did not know at the time throughout the night that this was going on because we were separated by, uh, I think, two wings of higher story buildings. And uh, so even though there were a few shots, uh, they did not come through to where we were. Uh, and my brother actually visited me that night and he was sleeping outdoors on the balcony and, a, and he would have heard it if, if it had happened. Uh, but the uh, bottom line with us and how we learned about it was we in our suite had a group of five guys that went out on a five mile run every morning. So we came down the stairs and uh, went to the back gate, which was usually a sleepy little affair in which uh, a guard, usually a corporal in the German army. Uh, and, uh, and one time he was even asleep back there because there wasn't any action at this gate behind the village. But that day it was different. There were uh, some uh, uh, security people with submachine guns, and there was a big crowd of uh, people on the other side of the gate. So as we weaved our way through the gate, uh, we found out that the crowd was composed of reporters. They were trying to get a story. So they started firing questions at us, and, and we didn't know. We had to learn from them what was going on. They told us. Uh, so we... Uh, we started our five mile loop around. And just to show you how the minds of 20 something uh, athletes would, uh, would, would go, uh, we realized that one of the runners with us was my brother, Charlie, who did not have credentials to get back in the village. So we got this little conspiracy going as to how we would be able to sneak him back in. Uh, we decided to run through the motor pool area, which we had run through before. They had these toll booth type places. Uh, I had a USA shirt on, so I gave my brother Charlie the USA shirt, and uh, I had my credential and ran up to the toll booth security gate and showed him my credential and said, he's with me, and he showed his USA shirt, and they just waved us back in. <laughs> So, so much for the, uh, the increase in security. But fortunately, there weren't any other incidents that occurred. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered, I heard about it, but at that time um, I, was, I was young. I didn't hear it until many, many years later. And it just, sure. you just kind of lose the details of, of the time. But um, definitely, I thought that was a good question that, that, that someone had asked. Um, all right, so I want to want to move on, um, maybe change our focus into to talking about the run walk uh, run method and, and and your training organization and and 
some of the other accomplishments around that. And um, one of the questions that just comes up over and over again in, in the group is, you know, here you are, you're an Olympian, you're a professional runner, you now have an opportunity to, to do something um, to the, the run block method is, is millions of people probably used it in some form or another. And, and what was the genesis of that? Like you went from Olympian and, and running races and then all of a sudden now there's um, when you, when you got into coaching and you got into to training, how did that come about? Immediately after I made the Olympic team, I had already committed to be a teacher for the school year, uh, 72, 73. And uh, during that year, um, I realized that uh, classroom teaching was just not for me. I love teaching. I love the essence of teaching. I wanted to teach, but I wanted to teach running. I wanted to teach fitness. Uh, I wanted to teach good nutrition to people so that they might be able to experience the lifestyle change that I did and how beneficial it was. And I had seen others who were beginning to get into uh, running and were uh, getting these same benefits. So after that school year, I made plans to open a running store. Now, the, the thing about 1973 and running is that there really weren't very many people running. There certainly weren't enough people running to be able to support a running store. But I had this gleam in my eye and the enthusiasm uh, and the willingness to sacrifice financially to be able to make the, this happen, uh, which I did. And so uh, I, then I had to find other ways to keep the doors open. So I did training consultations with people. I had clinics. I started my running retreats that are held throughout the year in different places like Florida and, and California. Uh, and uh, I uh, also was asked to teach a class in beginning running for a local university. Well, um, I saw this as a great way to bring people into my store. When we convened the first class of 22, it was obvious that none of them had been doing any running at all. They were terribly out of shape. So in order to keep them in the game, I realized right away that I had to put walk breaks in. And I remember very clearly the very first run we took to sort people into groups. The uh, bottom line was huffing and puffing, which I, I still use to this day for beginners because your respiration rate is directly tied to heart rate. Uh, so I scheduled we broke up into three groups based on current ability. And I scheduled each of the groups to meet with me at my store on a different day of the week. So I could really devote my attention to them when we did our weekly run together. Uh, and the amounts of running and walking were seat of the pants back then, because I didn't really have any data at all to be able to differentiate. But I started collecting the data right then. And over the years now, I have heard back from over 500,000 runners who have used Run, Walk, Run in some form. And I've been able to set up based on the Run, Walk, Run that worked best per pace per mile. Uh, and that's what has fueled it. But it started in 1974 in that little group of 22 uh, and uh, I followed up with them six months later, and every one of them was still running and still enjoying it and still using Run, Walk, Run. But moving ahead a little bit, I, I started developing training groups out of my Fidipides store from that point. And um, it uh, was a wonderful thing to get these success stories but I didn't use it myself except for long runs. Even when I was training for the Olympics, I was either training at, in the heat of Tallahassee, 
uh, and the humidity of Tallahassee, or I was up at Vail, Colorado with altitude, and I found it necessary in order to avoid exhaustion to put strategic walk breaks. And so uh, I used uh, run, walk, run on my long runs, even when I was at the world-class level. But in 1978, I started switching to running my, all of my runs that way. In, in 78, I had had a string of bad races. The times were getting slower and slower. And I just got this realization that that was probably the end of my progression of improvement. And I probably wouldn't set any more PRs. So I decided that my next goal was to run injury free until I was 100. And that's still my goal. Uh, so I uh, started working with groups and, and enjoying their success stories. But I was wrong about the PRs. Uh, two years later, I set my lifetime PR in the marathon of 216. And I was, uh, I, I put in walk breaks every two miles from the beginning. Uh, so if you want to know what, uh, what I have found to be the fastest time that someone has turned in so far, as far as I know, it was me on a 216. That's incredible. Incredible. And, um, yeah, I've, I've noticed that with, um, even when I was running the running club here in Columbus, uh, that I had run, we had, we used the run walk to start. I had somebody show up literally on the first day of the thing. And she goes, I can't run 50 feet. <laughs> and, um, what was so cute about this is, is, uh, she showed up, we started off on January 3rd or something in Columbus, cold weather. And she, she was not even wearing running clothes. She had an Eskimo jacket and it was all zoomed up and all you could see was little eyes and she's waddling over and, and the lady and, and we're really good friends. Um, and she went on to run half marathons, but she shows up and she goes, she goes, she goes, you guys are all dressed like runners. She's like, she's like, like, I feel like she's like, I can't, you know, she was, and I was like, you can't like, we just need to, I, I don't care if you can run 50 feet, run 50 feet, stop and walk a little bit and take catch your breath and run 50 feet. And, um, <laughs> It's, it was so cute with, you know, the fact she was, she was a lady probably in her forties. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it, we use, we used it all the time. And one thing we noticed is, is a lot of runners um, in, in the Columbus marathon, um, as I was running the Columbus marathon, I would see people run walking and I would almost catch up and then they'd take off again. And then I'd almost catch up and they'd take off again and they got better race, you know, race uh, times than I did. And that was kind of an idea. At that time, I wasn't coaching. And I was just kind of like, that's interesting to me because I always thought to, to get a great race time, I'd have to run fast. And what I noticed was they used those little short walking phases. Well, probably helped with their fueling. It probably helped with their ability to kind of mini recover on the fly and it extended it. And then their running portions were faster as opposed to what I did. My first marathon is I ran 22 miles. I hit the 20, as soon as I hit that wall, I was walking a lot. I was, I was the, the zombie crossing my first, uh, until that last 100, 200 meters. And all of a sudden you get energy again and the excitement kicks in. But um, yeah, I, I build in, even with some of the athletes um, I have coached to slow them down on long run days. Like you're running your long runs too fast, put in walking breaks. Um, because I use the huffy, I, uh, I use the out of breath. I'm like, if you can't sing a song, you're going, you know, you're not ready to run that pace yet and for easy paces. Right. So it's incredible. What is it about um, the run walk method that you think helps in terms of race performance and race times? I know there's the aspect of it of getting people up to the point where they feel like they can run more, but why would it, why would somebody, why should somebody consider using run, walk, run, who is an experienced runner, um, you know, what, where, where would you kind of point them? Well, it's uh, the natural way that the human body is designed to uh, cover distance, uh, according to the anthropologists that study ancient man. Uh, there's a really great book called Story of the Human Body by Daniel Lieberman, 
an evolutionary biologist from Harvard. And um, he and, and a number of other anthropologists that I've interviewed tell me that uh, our species began about 6 million years ago and regularly the individuals starved to death at some point because it, it was uh, the competition for food was so fierce. And so what our ancestors discovered fairly early in the game is that they needed to walk and keep walking all day and sometimes all night in order to find enough food to survive. Um, and then having come down from trees, uh, which our ancestors did, um, the walking created our species to be long distance walkers. And we are designed to go mile after mile after mile after mile, day and night walking. Running, not so much. Uh, we were designed to run for short distances to get away from predators and to uh, go in later to go in on a hunt uh, against animals at the end of it. But uh, to run long distance nonstop is not something the human body was designed to do. So when we insert walk breaks, we go back to a period of time in our history in which our ancestors used a form of hunting called persistence hunting. And that is they would run a short distance to spook an animal they wanted for dinner. And uh, then they would creep up uh, on it, stalk it by walking to recover. And then they would jog a short amount over and over again until several hours later when the animal would go into heat exhaustion because the an animals don't have sweat glands and we do. And we're talking about Africa. Uh, so we're really going back to our roots by running and walking. And as a result, we don't have to put our joints and, and our orthopedic structures into that extreme state that causes injury. We can save our energy resources and we can uh, go faster in races because if you save the resources early, they will be available later on. And that becomes the difference in running faster at the end of a race. The average improvement when former nonstop runners go to the right run, walk, run is over 13 minutes faster with run, walk, run. Yeah, I can see it. Um, and I'm 52 years old and I'm transitioning to more run, walk, run um, because the wear and tear, even though I know how to train appropriately and easy and recovery and all that, it's harder. Um, and I'm way past the point where, um, you know, I really care about my runs in terms of race times and things like that. I was, I, I was a late bloomer. I didn't start running until my middle to late thirties. Um, and hated every minute of it for the first year <laughs> um, until one day it just snapped um, in, into place. But I, I'm i doing it more, not so much that I can get great race times. Um, and I honestly, because of COVID, I haven't raced in it almost a year and a half, uh, like most people. Um, so I'm going back into more of a run walk. Um, and I, I haven't done that. I did it on long runs and I've done it from times when like, I would be out for running for a while and I was just transitioning back in. Well, I had to because I let myself get out of shape, but um, I'm looking very forward to seeing how this next you know, series of races when I get back into half marathons again. Um, I've done a few marathons. I don't particularly care for them as much as the halves. I don't feel as beat up afterwards. Um, but yeah, I think uh, um, I'm looking for longevity. I, I've told people like, I don't care. Like I can make you fast in the next short term in the next year or two but I, would, I don't want to, to do long-term damage or do things that I think will take the fun out of running, right? Instead, I'd rather have you run to 100. I've used that term numerous times. I said, I'd rather you run in your, be in your 80s and 90s and 100s and be able to run and not feel like you can't get out of bed in the morning. And um, Runners so get into this, uh, this old uh, quandary because we all know that we feel so much better 
when we run regularly. So we want to, to keep running, but if we run nonstop or run too fast or both, then things break, they're gonna break, or we're exhausted and life is not fun. But with the right run, walk, run, you can change all of that up. You can still get all the brain benefits. Uh, when I wrote my book, Mental Training, I had to go back to school and what goes on in the brain and what causes the uh, running to create these amazing changes in us. And it's the brain circuits that are turned on. They're, they're ancient in origin because this is what kept our ancient ancestors going to the next food supply. But the circuits are life-changing, uh, the better attitude circuit, the vitality circuit, the empowerment circuit. We turn those on every time we run, and particularly if we stay out there for 30 minutes. Yeah, brain's fascinating. It's, it's incredible. 50%, I think, of our calories go to fuel our brain or something. It's just, and there's a reason why that is, you know, it's like, it's, it's so missed, it's so not understood, but our, our brain circuits get rusty. And, and, and I like to think of it as like, we're polishing off the, the dust, you know, we got to get out there and, and yeah, that. it's, uh, it's fascinating. I've, I've done a lot of study, um, self-study just in that area, because like one of the hardest things about training athletes, and you know, this is, it's not what to do a lot yeah. of the times, right? It's how can I be self-motivated to do it when I don't feel like doing it? And I think one of the things I've had people who are trying to push certain paces or trying to push certain times is like, you're putting pressure on yourself in the wrong area. Like, if, if you're not hitting this pace, it's because you're not ready for it, um, usually. And and why don't you slow yourself down um, and maybe take a little longer time to get there? But I, I think I, I think just getting people into the habit when we first start off as running runners, right? What do we feel like? We feel like we got to be able to run a mile right off the bat. And like, no, let's let's build the habit first. And what I like about run, walk, run method, you can apply it to the experienced runners, obviously, right? And you can do it to the brand new runner who has never run before and help build the habit when running doesn't feel like it sucks so much, right? And yeah. if you can build the habit, then you will have the habit to get you out on those days. Absolutely. And uh, we all know that we have the choice every time we start a run. We can make ourselves totally miserable by the run, depending on uh, how hard we run, uh, how many walk breaks we take from the beginning and so forth. Although the other choice is with the right uh, uh, run, walk, run strategy, we're in control and we can take away that buildup of stress every time we take a walk break, be strong at the end. And in races, there's nothing more empowering in life than passing people at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and I hate being the one being passed because that's <laughs> in, in some sense, because we're, we're, we're humans and we self compare all the time and, and, and it's much better to be in the other position. Um, before I wrap up, there is a, a couple just little questions. Um, you mentioned finding the right run, walk, run strategy or finding the run, right run walk, run, plan. So you're the, you're the creator. You're the, you're the person here. I have you on the, on the Zoom call here with me. How, if I go out, how do I know what that is? Like I, if I go to your site, how do I get into the right program? How do I find that? Well, you'll find a section on our website, jeffgalloway.com that will explain that. Um, further detail can be gained from my books. The Run, Walk, Run Method would be the, the key book there. Um, and then uh, the retreats and the uh, master classes that I put on. I'm actually teaching one of the master classes tomorrow. Uh, and there still are openings if people want to. But the, the bottom line is that this, uh, the amount of running and walking is based on pace per mile, but the pace has to be an accurate pace. You can't say, well, I'd love to run a five minute mile when you're currently running 
a 10 or 15 minute per mile. It, it's not gonna happen right away. I mean, it may happen in a few years, uh, but uh, we first go to what's called the magic mile. It's an assessment tool and it allows you to know very, very uh, accurately what you're currently capable of running. And then you can use that to determine what your long run pace should be, and then what pace you could shoot for in races, uh, 5K, 10K, half and full. Obviously the pace slows down as the distance gets longer. But I'll give you an example. Let's say that uh, you run a magic mile of 10 minutes flat. That currently predicts a 12 minute uh, pace in a half marathon and a 13 minute pace in a marathon, provided that you have ideal weather conditions and you do all the training, which also includes some speed work to prepare you for that pace. But uh, you'll also uh, know quickly by using the magic mile portion of our website, because we have a free computation function there. You can just plug in your time on the magic mile and it'll tell you what your long run pace should be and what your potential would be at various race distances. Uh, but taking this example, a 10 minute magic mile and a marathon predicts a 13 minute pace all out. So we add two more minutes to that for long runs. And uh, that's a 15 minute per mile pace. Um, the run walk run strategies are as follows. At 15 minutes per mile, it's run 15 seconds and walk for 30. If you are a little slower than that, a 16 minute per mile, that's run 10 seconds and walk 30. If you are 13 and 14 minutes per mile, it's uh, 15, 15, 20, 20, or 30, 30. At a uh, 12 and 11 minutes per mile, it's 60, 30, 45, 30, or 30, 30. Those are the three most popular. Then you, uh, come on down to 10 minutes per mile, and that it would be 90, 30, or 60, 30, and so forth. And you'll see all of those on the website, uh, but there's one other thing that everybody should know. Uh, when it's hot, you need to slow down. We've documented this by research, 30 seconds per mile slower for every five degrees of temperature increase above 60. Uh, sadly, Heat is the number one cause of death in running, and it's way ahead of second place, and I'm against death. And so uh, I have come up with this uh, rule that can really help people slow down, know how much they should slow down, and then you adjust your run, walk, run to more walking and less running as you slow down. Yep, I agree. I, I've noticed that myself. And in your numbers, I was when I first heard them, I was like, oh, wow, that's 20 seconds. And, and so I was like, okay. But then I remember because when I was loosely doing it, you know, I was more down in that 10, nine and a half, 10 minute pace. And so that's why the numbers, when I, okay, and now the numbers make sense to me. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen the magic mile come up and, and it was interesting because I was like, well, why, why the mile versus say a five mile? Because a lot of others will look at like a five mile time, but five miles, not everybody can run five miles, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, and, and is that how you based your data off was the fact is like, let's start with the mile and, and again, however long it takes you to cover that mile, whether it's a combination of running, walking, it's a doable distance. Is that how you came about it? I actually started with five uh, Ks and 10 Ks back in the seventies, because uh, most of the marathoners of that era were running a lot of five Ks and 10 Ks. But I found that the number of my coaching clients would slough off during certain periods of their training in racing. And so I didn't have any documentation. And by doing a mile, it's easy to do. I mean, beginners can do it. We even have a half mile adjustment too. Um, but it can be done without getting you tired. Uh, you recover really fast from it. It's... Uh, 
now we have more than uh, 80,000 people in the database. So the predictability by data is very, very, very accurate. And uh, we uh, have found that the longer distances are also more affected by heat and weather conditions and the mile is not. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the advantage of having all that data is is, is when I track runners and I'll have them log their stuff into something like a final surgery training piece and stuff. It's like, I have data on one runner, but I don't have data, you know, that I can just go back and do correlations to. So we often, re, we, we rely on others like you and, and things like VDOT and these other types of different calculations to kind of, you know, leverage your data. So I was curious how that, how that came about. I had an idea, um, kind of how I know how it works, but, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a really, really cool thing. And, and I think what you've done, just to kind of wrap it up, and, and uh, is what you have done is made running accessible to millions of people. Um, looking back, that's got to be an incredible feeling. You probably, when you first started at the running store, you probably had no idea, right, that, that this is going to go. And um, so, first of all, I want to say on behalf of the running community, thank you um, for, for doing this. It, it's, uh, you know, we're using it, even if we're not doing the official, Galloway run, walk, run method. I would say that most running coaches nowadays when they're working with beginners are using some form of run, walk, right? And, and uh, it's incredible. Um, and that's, I mean, that's on top of the, what, two dozen books you've written and all the different things that you've done and, and races that you've put on. And, and uh, um, my, I, my aunt and uncle, who are down in Atlanta are just probably, they don't know I'm talking to you yet, but when they find out, they'll be smiling because, you know, they're, they're from Atlanta and like, Jeff, like six years ago, I got to talk to Jeff. He's a legend down here in Atlanta. <laughs> it's like, oh, super. Um, so yeah, so they'll be super happy, but um, Hey Jeff, it was super awesome to talk to you. Um, I will, you know, I'll, I'll post your, your links on the thing. Uh, I assume the best place is jeffgalloway.com. Is there any place else you want to share? Oh, besides run, walk, um, run, there was one question I was going to ask. What are a couple of the other books that you've written that you would recommend for, you know, what would be kind of the next go-tos? Because you have well, so many. For motivation, my mental training book is, uh, is really a star. And uh, it uh, really explains why we get unmotivated and then some simple ways that we can turn the unmotivation around. Cognitive strategies that give you control over your motivation. Um, the other book uh, is my original book that has just been revised thoroughly. It's called Galloway's Book on Running and it is the longtime bestseller among running training books, but now it's been updated this year. So uh, we have those uh, from our website if you want it autographed, but it's uh, truly my best book in terms of training. Excellent. I have that book and I have Run, Walk, Run. Um, I do not have mental training. I have heard of it, um, but I will definitely be picking that one up. So anyways, um, besides, besides uh, jeffgalloway.com, best way to, to follow you all your, yeah, that, your retreats are going to be and all that kind of stuff. We have a free newsletter that uh, has all types of new things that we are offering and uh, ways to deal with uh, challenges that runners have and so forth. And if you have any individual questions, I'm fine with answering those. My email address is real simple. It's jfg at jeffgalloway.com and i'd love to hear from your listeners and and anyone who needs help along the way i'm there to help uh, yeah i appreciate it. you've always been very accessible <laughs> you, you've definitely made a lifetime of uh of impact and and you've always been somebody at least my perception is is you're always available you're at race expos you've been at you travel a lot to do this and it's quite incredible. So, so uh, Jeff, I want to thank you for, for being on the show. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing. I love the story. I love learning about people's background. Like I, we, we know you from the books, we know you from run walk, but I really wanted to go. What was, what was young Jeff like? <laughs> great. And I so, um, have enjoyed this very much, Steve. All right. So, um, thanks for being on the show. We'll talk to you soon and hold on one second. I'll 
chat with you real quick here at the end. Sounds great. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye.